Welcome to another CHRO Conversation, hosted by the Center for Executive Succession at the Darla Moore School of Business. I'm your host, Anthony Nyberg, and today we are speaking with Susan Peters, Senior Vice President of HR for GE, and she is responsible for the global workforce of about 300,000 employees located in over 175 countries around the world. Thank you very much for joining us today. This is really a great treat for us. Thanks, Anthony. So the first thing that everyone wants to know is kind of in general, what is it that HR does to help with fulfilling an organizational strategy? But to get to that point, what are some of the real challenges that you're facing at GE these days? Well, as with any organization, I think one of the biggest challenges is just change. We've just had a new CEO, so that's change, change of leadership. There's change of environment. Uh, I think the world markets are continuing to evolve, so there's always that. There's geopolitical change and, and risk that evolves all the time. But uh, perhaps one of the biggest changes that we're dealing with now is just the uh, ever-present technical change, both being in the digital space, the use of technology and the work that people do. And I think the essence of what we have to do in HR is help people handle that change. There's lots of ways to do that. Uh, obviously, if you're a small organization, uh, you can focus on the work at hand and really train people. When you're doing it at scale, you're doing it much more from a cultural perspective so that people have the right approach and attitude about change. And I think that's one thing that we've been focused on in HR. So that's really interesting because people don't often associate HR with technology in, in a clear connection like mm -hmm. that. And you're talking about having to help people even embrace it and understand it. Are there specific things you do to create a culture where people are open to that kind of change? Well, first of all, I think it's about uh, experience. People are more comfortable when they've had an experience in which they use the technology. That enables them to understand it. So we're doing quite a bit of work ensuring that uh, individuals have all the tools and access, and I'm talking not just the tools that you and I would use daily, but understanding how to use a data lake, understanding how to um, leverage the technology capabilities that exist. So there's quite a bit of skills training that is happening now in HR and then beyond HR to ensure that people are ready for the technical uses. One of the best examples is when you put a a horizontal team together to solve a problem. And you have people from a variety of functions, from the design world, from the manufacturing world, from the marketing and selling part of it, all coming together to solve, let's say, product cost. And they work as a horizontal team using the information from all functions. So what you might see is that instead of people approaching that problem solution through their lens, their vertical lens. They're now doing it in a very horizontal way with information in a data lake that's provided by everybody. And that's the kind of experimentation that you have to do to ensure people get practice. That's how the organization and the culture eventually moves forward. So uh, it's very interesting, the discussion about change and um, what HR's involvement is throughout that. What do you do and what does GE do that specifically to help create an environment where, where, where you're really developing talent that appreciates this sort of change and continual adaptation? Yeah. I think there is a, a real essence to that question because if you don't get it right with your talent development, they don't come because they understand through the employment brand of your entity that you don't develop talent and they don't stay. So this is foundational. So the way we think about it is that we believe everybody in HR or in any other function should be in a situation or a job in which they are stretched. I would almost use the word uncomfortable because most learning happens when people are outside of their comfort zone. So the first thing you want is for people to have more work, either qualitatively or quantitatively, than they probably can handle. Once they're in that role that's bigger than they think they can handle, you then really want visibility, accountability, and feedback. So we really think about it that way, making sure that the individual has visibility. People see what they're doing and they feel that. Accountability, we hold people accountable. Outcomes matter. What did you deliver? When? How? And then feedback. And the coaching and feedback part of this is massive. I would say particularly in the early part of the career, but that doesn't stop. And 
Frankly, it might even be harder to do it later in the career, but it's equally important then. So I'd say that's the formula. Stretch, or a level of being uncomfortable, and then visibility, accountability, and feedback. So that is really interesting to me, uh, the visibility, accountability, and feedback in particular. Um, but the idea of telling people that they're going to be better and you're going to be developing them by pushing them beyond where they're comfortable. Mm -hmm. So can we use that for our students now? That can be my excuse sure. for why we overwork them sure. in their minds. Well, I do believe that uh, people work to the expectation level that is set, and the expectation level has to be quite high. And what we know about people in leadership is that if the expectation curve is going like this, their growth curve, while on an upward trajectory, is only like this, over time, that gap gets bigger, and they're no longer capable to do the role. So they have to both understand the level and, and sort of trajectory of the expectations and equal it or beat it. And in today's world, which is complicated and changing quickly, the addition of technology, as we've talked about, the, the context of the world, geopolitically or otherwise, this is really hard. People have to you know, be sort of on a, an up, upward treadmill a long time. Uh, the wonderful thing is that I think it's what excites people, the challenge, the uh, opportunity to grow. People like to grow. They want a line of sight to something that's going to stretch them and challenge them. So that's the good news. It, it actually sounds like a great lesson for all of society, that people will do better when we set higher expectations. Absolutely. And HR is like, is in so many things, is leading the way in, in helping that, in particular HR at GE. Well, I think that's true, Anthony. Um, we like to think about uh, human resources, our talent development, almost like product development. And we know from all of the interfaces we have with the products that you and I interface with that products get better and different all the time. Uh, we probably aren't using the same cell phone that we used five years ago because the capabilities have increased. Well, really, the same is true with people and people development. So we, as HR product developers, need to think about it that way. What is the next level of expectation around people and leaders, and how do we help them get there? You know, you and I aren't the same people we were five years ago. We wouldn't really want to be known no. as that person. So we have to be thinking about what's next and help people almost see around corners to what is that next capability that they need to have. How does an organization like GE with over 300,000 employees both encourage people to be heard and at the same time balance that with the need for everyone to be respectful and professional and keeping a really inclusive workplace? Well, I think it's an accurate observation of the societal point that we're at, and I suspect it will only increase with time. And we, of course, do get individual comments, um, pushback, uh, um, feedback from employees all over the world all the time. We've used some uh, tools and technology that I think are helpful in this vein. Uh, we actually have a place where anybody can ask any question of our CEO, and then that question gets voted up based on the number of people who like it. In other words, you use the same technology that we use as consumers to decide what does the environment really want to hear about. So weekly, we literally take an iPhone and ask John Flannery to answer a few questions, and sometimes they're HR specific, so I might answer one, and we take that very quick video and put it back out. But we basically respond to the questions that have gotten the most votes. And if a question is so individual that it doesn't get votes, it's sort of like the internet. It's, it's a balancing, it's the, the governing body of the community decides what to respond to. So uh, obviously if individual notes or questions come in directly to me or to the CEO, uh, we respond to them, we have it followed up by the business team or whomever. You wanna make sure you have an open um, environment and that people feel they can ask the questions, but when you're trying to solve for every question, you use some of these great technical tools to determine which are the most important to respond directly to the organization on. So uh, as we were talking, you have mentioned that you are actually have been part of four different CEOs at GE, which is really quite a remarkable feat. Can you share with us some of the things that, particularly in your role as CHRO, that HR or in general companies need to do to help new CEOs acclimate to their new role? So it's a great question. Um, obviously, I 
was not involved in some of those earlier successions, uh, Reg Jones to Jack Welch, but I knew Jack quite well, Jack to, to Jeff Himmelt, and not directly involved in that, but certainly um, very much uh, mid to senior career at that point, and then the most recent succession from Jeff Himmelt to, to John Flannery, and obviously extremely involved in that one. So that's exactly the point we're at, which is how do you make sure that a CEO uh, transitions well and um, has a platform for success. And I think there are several uh, tenants to it. Uh, the first is getting the right CEO. We feel great about that. The second is uh, ensuring that the employees, particularly in a large complex company like GE, 300 plus thousand people in 170 plus countries around the world, get to know this person. We are a leader-centric leader culture. Not just GE, but I think most institutions are leader-centric. So people want to know them. Now, luckily today we're advantaged by technology. And I mentioned earlier that we do sort of a weekly, very quick, three, five minute um, video, answering questions, getting to know him. Uh, we're doing weekly calls with all of our officers in the company just to ensure there's a rhythm of what's going on in the company and to get to know John. We've done more um, direct content and contact with John and his direct reports physically together and then about every two and three week, two to three weeks time together. So there's a very explicit um, process we're going through to ensure people get to know him as a leader and as a person, and I think both those aspects are important. Uh, the second thing, of course, uh, is how does he get to know the breadth and scope of the role? Luckily, um, in GE, and particularly with John, he has started a lot of new jobs. I mean, we were very intentional about the development steps we would put him through to prepare him to become the CEO, and so he's been in a lot of new jobs. We sent him to India in 2009. He took the corporate BD job in 2012. He became the CEO of our healthcare business in 2014. And my point is that starting a new job whatever level it is, including at the CEO level, requires a certain um, understanding of the scope of the work and what's new and different. So we're doing a lot of sessions on uh, sort of everything you ever wanted to know but were afraid to ask kind of things, and that's the, the process that we're in right now. And uh, he digs deep, he asks a lot of questions, I think that's the most robust approach to the process. So it's really interesting because I think a lot of people wouldn't fully appreciate that someone who's been so well groomed to become the leader of a great organization would that people wouldn't know who that is so they are, you're spending some time having people get to know him in this case and at the same time that he might not have a really complete grasp mm -hmm. of every aspect of the organization yeah my my sense is that would be true in any situation in any organization it's certainly true in GE which is so big and so complex multiple businesses each business being large and large entity in and of themselves. The business he ran previously, our healthcare business, is a $20 billion business in and of itself. So a very important part of the portfolio, and he had his head down working on healthcare. In GE, there is some introduction across then the portfolio that has to be done, both getting to know him as a person and content. And that's really what we're doing, is trying to ensure that that's done well and um, it doesn't take that long because the leadership team of the company comes together and is connected in many ways. Um, and we have a lot in common, uh, what we call the GE store, which is the, the horizontal connectedness of the company, which is the fact that we have a common research approach, you know, global research center, that we have a common global growth organization, meaning the way we approach the particularly emerging markets, and frankly, a common HR approach, which is the backbone of the company in many ways, a common culture, a common set of beliefs, a common set of um, leadership tenants that people um, used to be one even though they're in different industries. So all of that is already sort of a check mark. It's just the deep understanding of the of the financial and technical aspects of the other businesses. So that's really remarkable how you talk about HR in some regards as being the backbone mm -hmm. company, which we of course agree with completely here. But can you talk a little bit about your role as an executive and in terms of 
because HR is such a critical role, and as we've talked about, GE has done an amazing job over the years for this. But what is your interaction as a, as a member of the executive team coming from the HR perspective? Mm -hmm. Well, I'd say I'm a member of the business team with HR perspective, and uh, we're all trying to make the best business decisions and business outcomes. And of course, my role is to not only represent and advocate for employees, but to understand uh, the um, areas of expertise that have to be contributed, whether you're adding talent or taking talent out, uh, who the talent is, uh, organizational structure and design, uh, labor relations, obviously, compensation and benefits are a huge part these days of the cost of a company and therefore the complexity, how you design your your compensation programs to ensure you're motivating people in the right way. And this is so much a part of the business discussion these days that it, it really is a, um, you're just a member of the business team. Uh, I'm also, as would be any HR person, sort of the, the coach and maybe um, friend to a lot of my peers and colleagues, uh, sort of a, a safe place to go with questions and concerns. I think that's an important role that the CHRO plays when uh, the stakes are high and these leaders are in massively large and important and impactful jobs that they also have a place for their own um, feedback and learning and support. And so it's an interesting combination of, if you will, the hardware and the software of the HR job. You know, it's hard interviewing you because everything you say leads to so many additional <laughs> questions I'd like to note. So, okay. But on one part of that, you were talking about, you, you led with business first, which is mm -hmm. really interesting in what we certainly preach mm -hmm. to all of our master's students. Um, but the, uh, this last part that you said also is really interesting to me, that about being kind of the coach to the rest of the team. Mm -hmm. So often we forget that the executive team could be more functional if they mm -hmm. were more of a team. Mm -hmm. And in some regard, you see your role as Absolutely. helping that? Absolutely. Um, I, you know, you, you take suggestions for improvement, process improvement or individual improvement from anywhere that it comes. But I do see my role as the person who might best be able to facilitate it and make it happen. So how and when we came to, and where we came together when John Flannery first became the CEO was something that I orchestrated. Certainly I sought the advice and input from a variety of people, both peers and others, so that I could gain perspective. But uh, ensuring it happened and it happened in the right way is something that we facilitate. And it's the, um, it's definitely a part of the role to ensure that the leadership team functions exactly as that, as a team. And we believe, I think most organizations believe that you get better outcomes when you operate as a team. And that's what we're here to do is get the best outcomes. So we're, we're all in. Hey, this has truly been fascinating for me and great fun. So thank you very much for joining us. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. You just listened to another CHRO conversation. Today, Susan Peters of GE shared her views regarding why creating an effective HR function is essential to the success of every organization. And she shared with us some of the secret tools that GE uses well to lead the world in developing HR talent. As you also heard, the challenges facing the new generation of HR professionals are immense, but interesting, making HR the function that is critical and fun. On behalf of all of us who are associated with the Masters of Human Resource program here at the University of South Carolina and the Center for Executive Succession, thank you for joining us.